Welcome to my first episode of my brand new podcast, Secondary Sources. For our first episode, we'll be diving deep into the complicated life of the Iron Marshal, Louis de Vu, Napoleon's best general. De Vu was born in Enlou, France, and was a descendant of low Burgundian royalty. His father, Jean de Vu, was a military man and a veteran of the Seven Years' War. The de Vu family was one of strong military tradition that went all the way back to the 1600s. At age eight, the Vu's father was killed in a hunting accident, leaving the estate in the trusting hands of the Vu's mother and grandmother. His mother was able to raise de Vu and his siblings with a humble inheritance left by her husband. Money troubles will consistently affect the de Vu family throughout his childhood. De Vu would later carry the weight of his family's financial troubles when he became Marshal of France and would be consistently bailed out by Napoleon through large donations or by given by being given large swaths of land, particularly in Germany and Poland. During the Vu's childhood, he would attend two military schools, one in Anon and another in Paris. The Vu would excel in algebra and geometry and even get awards for it. De Vu's worst subject was German, which is ironic because De Vu would spend most of his military career in Germany and Poland. These schools were designed for low nobility to rise up the ranks in the noble caste system. And uh, yeah. after De Vu graduated, he was assigned to the Royal Champagne Regiment, the same regiment his father was in. And when he joined, his uncle and cousin were both still in the regiment. The crown knew of the Vu's financial issues and actually donated um, a uniform for the Vu because of how expensive uniforms were. But in 1789, the Vu would embrace the revolution and started reading heavily into the political philosophies of Rousseau and Montesquieu, which uh, obviously created a lot of enemies within the Royal Champagne Regiment. And people viewed the Vu as kind of a hypocrite because he was a noble himself and the crown paid for his uniform. And it got to a point where even his uncle called him out saying, my nephew de Vu will never amount to anything. He will never be a soldier in a place of working military theories. He occupies himself with politics. De Vu would eventually get arrested for his views when he was outspoken about some men in his regiment that were discharged without any military tribunal due to their revolutionary sympathies. The Vu would be sent to a prison fortress where he would spend six weeks in a dank cell. And after he was released, he was sent home in disgrace and formally kicked out of the military. During this time, the Vu would dive deep into history and political philosophy, things he really enjoyed. And after a couple months, he would return to the military in 1791 after the National Assembly called for volunteer units. The revolution created a, a sort of vacuum within the military command structure, with most high-ranking officers leaving the military en masse. This then was able to create a place where the Vu was able to rise quickly up the ranks, unlike his uncle and father, who, after years of service, only made it to the ranks of corporal. De Vu was voted to the rank of Lieutenant Corporal uh, of the 3rd Battalion due to his military education. During this time, De Vu quickly got married and then divorced after his wife was unfaithful. Also during this time, De Vu got involved into a pretty dramatic domestic dispute when a group of citizens were trying to escape the revolution and were hiding out in a local inn. When the villagers found out, they quickly formed a mob and tried to storm the inn. De Vu then got his regiment in between the inn and the mob, and after a couple hour standoff, the mob dispersed. De Vu believed in the revolution, but not mob justice, and would consistently stand by unpopular opinions at great personal risk to himself. And we see this again and again throughout his life. Wow. After, shortly after this, the 3rd Battalion marches north and joins the army of Belgium, where they were assigned to the left wing of the army under Commander Domenez. The Vu fought well at the Battle of Jampos, if I said that right, go easy on me, and siege Brussels. But the Allied forces counterattacked and defeated Domenez 
at the Battle of Nerwinden, if I said that right. The Vu's men held the center, but were forced to the retreat after the left flank collapsed. After the battle, Dumez started negotiating with the Allies. Dumez's plan was to march on Paris and restore order himself, and um, the Vu got wind of this, and he got pretty upset, obviously. And he started to, he uh, rallied a bunch of men together, and they created a search party, and they were going to go arrest this rogue general. The Vunas party found the general returning from negotiations with the Allies, and a dramatic chase broke out, where the general barely escaped as bullets cr crashed in the tree line around him. And they almost caught him when the general's horse refused to jump off, uh, the, to make a jump over this uh, mud putt. This mud hole and he got off the horse and shoved an officer uh, off his horse took it and rode away to safety <laughs> dramatically enough and after this the vu was promoted to general of the brigade and then he was asked to be promoted to general of the division but he refused knowing that general that uh that high of a rank was con was uh, really dangerous because they were being constantly purged and um the vu saw that the terror was coming and he would have to leave the army anyway and due to his noble birth he wasn't even allowed to be in paris so once again the vu found himself out of the job thinking his military career was over he would spend time reading history and politics again when he would get a knock on the door the revolution had come for his mother. Accusing her of having correspondence with French citizens that left the country, um, they decided to take her away. And the Vu packed his things and traveled with his mother and a small police escort. If found guilty, the Vu's mother would surely have been sentenced to death in the guillotine. And once the Vu got, uh, after talking to these officers for a little while, he got he heard the charges and he came up with a plan to save his mother. Now, this is insane. But what he did was, he, <laughs> he uh, during the night, he um, climbed out the window and ran home where his sister let him through the window. And he went to his mom's study and burnt all the evidence of any communications his mother might have had and then ran back to the inn he was staying in like nothing ever happened and this is and uh, the charges were then quickly dropped afterwards and there was a quick trial and she was let go and he saved his mother's life completely without a doubt and it just it's just really a reflection of his character and throughout his life he would do things like this and around this point he, the Jacobins shortly afterwards fell and Robespierre fell from power and was killed and they they were really looking for restoration and order in the country all French citizens around this time and the Vu shortly after all this returned to service um, as a commander in cavalry where he befriended one of the most influential men of his career, General uh, Dissy. And together they took part in the Siege of Luxembourg, where Davu was briefly captured in an Allied counterattack. This was the only time in his career where Davu would be captured by the enemy. And shortly after his um, capture, he was released. And he was gonna and he was ordered to return home under the condition that he would not serve. And this was pretty common in that day and age. So, basically, that it was kind of like you had to sign a letter, and then you were ordered to go home, and you were not allowed to be, uh, you were not allowed to keep fighting. And if you were caught, there would be dire consequences. And then, um, you know, the Vu would spend time reading history at his, at his house. And after an officer exchange in 1796, he was allowed to return to service, where Dissier was able to grant the Vu an audience with now the famous general, Napoleon. And it was 
it's interesting to see because without this uh Davu and Napoleon probably wouldn't have met or they wouldn't have gotten along so quickly as they did when they were in Egypt. Um, Dessier had became a household name in France during the Revolutionary Wars, and Napoleon was really happy to recruit him and take him away from the rival generals in the Rhine. And then around March in 1798, Napoleon and Davout had their first meeting. Davout made a wrong first impression. Davout never cared much for his own personal appearance or his uniform, and during their first meeting, meeting his uniform was in a terrible state and and it was lucky for Davout that um MP would take Dessie's word and uh Davout would set sail to Egypt with the expedition on May 8th 32,000 French troops landed a couple miles west of the grand city of Alexandria excuse me with the rest with the British on hot pursuit the French army marched along the beach and stormed the ancient city where the defenders locked the gate. Don't bravely stormed the, fi- the city, but held no command, and was only attached to the general headquarters. But after the storming of the city, Davu was given command of cavalry after his predecessor was killed in battle. Napoleon then led, after taking Alexandria, led his men to Cairo. The expedition failed to supply the men of canteens, and wells were few and far in between. So as they were marching, two Cairo men were dying left and right of exhaustion, passing out. And once they reached kind of like uh, closer to Cairo, they had the Battle of the Pyramids, where Davu led his cavalry and uh, smashed into the Mameluke lines. The stubborn Mamelukes held no chance against trained French cavalry, and shortly after the battle, Davu would come down with a case of dysentery. Dysentery would repeatedly appear throughout his two years in Egypt, and dysentery, if people who don't really know, is contracted by eating contaminated food or drinking water, which is commonplace among the expedition and depleted their ranks severely. Once the Vu recovered, he spent some time in Cairo reorganizing the cavalry, and the Vu's talents were, you know, slowly getting recognized by Napoleon. His military leadership in battle, along with his administration administrative duties, were also piquing his attention. And the Vu would actually eliminate some bandits into the uh, on the south, in the south of Cairo, uh, and he would destroy them completely in this one decisive uh, engagement. These bandits were harassing the French for for months, which is interesting to see. In December 1798. And the Vu would be sent down south to help, to help Dessier, who was aggressively pursuing the Mameluke army, but was suffering from lack of supplies and cavalry. The Vu brought cavalry, supplies, and gunboats. The gunboats were assess- essential in keeping Dessier's men uh, a quick-moving force, and uh, actually it really helped by carrying their cannons and a lot of their equipment, too. Uh, Dessier attacked a much larger Mameluke force, and during this attack, they formed these squares in battle that uh, prevented the Mameluke cavalry from piercing their infantry lines. And once again, the Wu would then break the Mamelukes with a sudden uh, uh, cavalry charge. And the Mamelukes would then rout again. And this time, they would go all the way down to Sudan. Dessier wrote highly of the Wu's performance, telling Napoleon that I have never seen such a beautiful, imposing charge as that by one of our cavalry. Throughout 1799, the Vu would travel with Dessier up and down the Nile, putting down resisting provinces. Around this time, Napoleon was off in the Syrian campaign, and it wasn't going well for Napoleon. And once he got word that a massive Turkish force was going to go land in Alexandria, threatening the whole expedition, Napoleon marched back to Cairo. The Turk- Turkish force landed with the assistance of the British fleet, but and the battle was so about was surely going to happen. But around this time, Davu was once again hit with a terrible case in dysentery, and this time almost died. During the landings, Davu was kept in reserve mostly, and he was still pretty sick. Napoleon was able to annihilate the Turkish invasion after the fight, and after the fighting, he deemed the expedition a failure. 
snuck aboard a ship, and went back to Paris to to coup the government. After Napoleon left, two camps formed within the French army. One camp was uh, under General Kelber, I think, if I said that right, and the other under Davout. Kelber wanted the evacuation of Cairo, of uh, the Egyptian campaign entirely, while Davout wanted to stay and wait for reinforcements. And Dessier stayed in the middle. Kelber took Napoleon's position after the departure, and after fierce back and forth between the two camps, Kelber saw the writing on the wall with the enclosing, enclosing Turkish forces and British Navy. He decided to negotiate with the British. And and the Vu would then get a passport along with his brother, and they would be able to return to France. Right before they landed on the French coast, they were intercepted by a British frigate, which took the Vu and his brother and put them in quarantine for a month before releasing them back to France. And after being released, they were once again at sea. They were ambushed by Tunisian pirates, who surprisingly gave them no trouble and let them go. <laughs> wow, the British, you know, quarantined them, had a whole big fit. Just funny. So, after Davout returned home, he was put into quarantine again, but this time with Dessier. Napoleon wrote to both of them extensively. Napoleon desperately needed both generals in the unstable months of his reign as first consul. This was after his coup. After quarantine, the Vu was ordered to Paris while Dessier was sent to Italy with Napoleon. Napoleon won one of the best victories of his career at Marengo. Dessier fought hard at the battle, but gave his life to achieve the victory. Marengo consolidated Napoleon's reign as first consulship and actually paved the way for his emperorship too. During this time, the Vu was given administrative duties, giving him time to fall in love and get married. He married a Leclerc, a sister, and uh, he married a Leclerc, which was connected to Napoleon's family because Napoleon's sister married a Leclerc. Now, this propelled the Vu high into Parisian social circles. And in 1804, when Napoleon crowned himself emperor, the Vu was promoted to Marshal of the Empire. And he was the youngest, too, the youngest Marshal. And this is the highest rank in French military and social circles, and these titles bring responsibilities in time of peace and war. And Davout during this time was able to use his newfound influence to restore his old military academy that was destroyed in the revolution. The vault, the Vu, would then bring back his old teacher as the principal and restore the school. And this was a really proud moment for the Vu that he was really able, he really felt he was making a difference here, and that order was being restored, which is what he really wanted. And and around this time, the Vu would then go up and prepare the army for the invasion of Britain, and would have correspondence with Napoleon, they would talk about disease conditions, and they would just have, uh, you know, about equipment, and uh, basically, you know, talk about, like, supplies. And then around this time, before... They could even invade Britain. The War of the Third Coalition broke out of. And this would be the first time Davu would prove himself as a military leader on a grand scale. Many people viewed Davu's promotion as nepotistic and that he was too young to hold the marshal's baton. Davu would consistently prove them wrong in a multiple, multitude of battles won while being mostly outnumbered. Davu would be given the command of the third corps later named the fifth corps as an homage to caesar for a spectacular performance they broke camp on august 29th and on november 8th a march to the city of vienna shortly after napoleon the vu saw limited combat during the march and moved his army between vienna the austrian army was in full retreat and linked up with the russian army at the small village of austerlitz napoleon knew that he was outnumbered and he ordered the Vu to march his army to him as fast as he could. The Vu was able to march his army 75 miles in a couple of days, reaching the battle at 7 a.m. December 1st. A pro- uh, getting close around the one-year anniversary where Napoleon crowned himself emperor. 
the Vu was ordered to hold the right flank and held off a combination a combined force four times his size. During the fighting, the Vu got four horses shot out from under him, and around nine be, and around nine o'clock, he noticed that the Russian force was trying to cut him off from Marshal Salt's division. The Vu then led a devastating counter uh, counterattack, routing the much larger Russian force. Russian Allied force. After the Battle of Austerlitz, the War of the Third Coalition abruptly ended with Napoleon the victor, and his emperorship consolidated. The following summer, war would break out again, but this time with Prussia, and the Vu would yet again lead his Third Corps into battle. Before, before war with Prussia, the Vu was able to get some time off that was unfortunately cut short, but he was able to see his newborn daughter, Josephine, named after the Empress. But the Prussians were on the march, and the Prussian army around this time was very weak. It was very outdated, and they relived the glory days of Frederick the Great, and they were desperately behind on the new kind of warfare that the Napoleonic Wars brought to the table. The Prussians' army plan was to fight offensively, loosely. Their, their plan was really loose, and their plan generally was to fight offensively and push the Russian army back across the Rhine, but at last minute, the weak Prussian command changed their strategy to defensive. And the Prussians really didn't stand a chance against the aggressive, fluid movements of Napoleon's army. And by October, the Grand Armée was crossing the frontiers of Prussia. Fro cross yeah, crossing into the frontiers of Prussia. Uh, Napoleon would pursue the Prussians to the Battle of Jean and then order his... I think it's... Yeah, Jean... Yeah and order his marshals to converge on him. The Vu's advance guard ran into the Prussians, and due to the heavy fog, did not know that he stumbled across a massive Prussian army. And later nicknamed, uh, the Vu's later nicknamed the Iron Marshal after this battle, he would hold off a massive Prussian assault that was twice the size of his, his force. The, his force. The Vu would then counterattack after a, a really bloody holding action, would then counterattack and pincer, leading to a devastating crossfire. And with two Prussian generals killed in the fighting, they withdrew. And this holding action plus counterattack would be known as the Battle of Aristide. Simultaneously, Napoleon was defeating the Prussians at Genoa. And after Aristide, the Vu would begin his fighting with fellow marshals. The Vu. And Napoleon both were furious with Marshal. Oh, I think it's Bernard. I don't know if I said that right. Who did not support either armies in Aristad or Genoa. And the Vu was went as far as saying, I should have had him shot. During this battle, the Vu sent word to. I'm, I'm sorry, I only see his name in it in um in reading when I'm reading, so I I really don't know how to pronounce it. I think it's I'm going to say Bernard, yeah. and sent word to uh, his camp multiple times to assist them, and he was just, he just didn't want to, and he wouldn't assist either battles, which really reamed him out, and this would create the Vu's rivalship with all the other marshals, and the Vu would really create enemies throughout his career, because he was stubborn. And he really didn't play the game of politics and social circles. He didn't really care for that. He mostly cared about the army, the condition of his army. Napoleon then granted the Vu to march his now famous Third Corps into Berlin before the rest of the army. The army was then renamed in homage of Caesar. The second phase of the campaign was the Polish War of Liber Liberation where Napoleon would attack the slowly mobilizing Russian army. The Vu would do then another impressive holding action against a combined Prussian and Russian force, where the fighting would go deep into the night, with the Vu riding throughout his lines, uh, demanding his men to hold firm as bullets would whiz past him. Napoleon would then end the war of the Fourth Coalition after the Battle of Ferdinand in June, and the negotiations would begin. After the war, the Iron Marshal would be given military governorship of Poland. Poland, again, would uh, be a revived state, but now under French administration. The idea of the revolution spread to Poland, but obviously the noble elite refused to, 
any concept of the revolution and rejected the new Polish constitution that was sent forward by Napoleon to the shock of the VU, not understanding why they preferred the old ways of nobility. The VU would work with his minister. Give me a second. I lost my place. Give me a second. See, I'm working like a little bit, like I'm doing a little bit of script, a little bit off the cuff. And then I'm playing also with like a, like a stress ball. And I dropped it, hitting the space bar, obviously. And <laughs> it just hit the space bar and bounced up. So give me a second. So grand scale, Erestad. So Polish reforms. Combined force four times the size. Third coalition. Oh, man, I went all the way up. So the marshal, yeah, governor of Poland was again revived under French administration. Noble elites, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I'm here. Anyway, to continue, they rejected the new Polish constitution, and the VU would then have to work with the Poles. And really, it was it was a re real, it was really difficult for him. But the VU would then slowly reform the Polish military while keeping his third corps, his army, well equipped. The Mara Marshal would slowly become respected and loved by his men, who viewed him kind of as a father figure. Napoleon would reward the Vu with swaths of land in Poland, along with uh, being granted the title the Duke of Erestad, his greatest victory. Napoleon, slowly, after a year or so, would sniff out that the Vu wanted more than just a dukedom. He wanted the crown of Poland himself. This is not as far-fetched as you might think. Napoleon gave a few marshals the crown of small countries. The Iron Marshal's rival, uh, was it Bernard? I think that's so. Uh, yeah. Bernard, maybe, was uh, titled King of Sweden, while another marshal, Marat, was given King of Naples. Davu was in the royal family, after all, and this wasn't as far-fetched. But ultimately, Napoleon viewed that the king of Saxony had the strongest claim to the Polish th throne and gave it to him instead. Around this time, Austria decided that they wanted to go to war with, French, with the French once again, but this time with the assistance of British money. Uh, Napoleon was overstretched and, uh, and uh, his armies throughout Spain, and Austria thought that they could quickly cross into French territory especially after sweeping reforms that were made within the army. But Napoleon got wind of this and left Spain and quickly got back to Paris to raise a massive army of 170,000 men. These recruits were raw and were unlike a majority of soldiers who were conscripted. Um, most soldiers that were conscripted were repeatedly conscripted, so they would have previous experience in the Revolutionary Wars or in a couple coalition wars. But these men were fresh recruits, young kids. And this led the army to be a lot slower than it usually was, um, leaving them prone to mistakes. The VU would build a massive intelligence network in Austria that proved to be pretty accurate. Um, he would know details of troop movements, and he would send these dispatches to the emperor. This gave Napoleon a general idea what he would be facing in the field and when they would attack. The Vu would be given 67,000 men, more than any other marshal in the war ramp campaign. And um, the war ramp campaign, yeah. And Austria would lose a golden opportunity to attack immediately instead of biding their time, mobilizing a massive army. Austria did not... Uh, and uh, eventually, uh, Napoleon would get wind of when they would attack when the spy rings slowly started going dark. So the French were pretty prepared, but were still taken, uh, were still hit pretty bad when the attacks first began. Uh, the uh, once it started, the Vu's army started rapidly retreating, and they were almost annihilated twice while crossing rivers and bridges. The Vu would work together with Marshal Berthier, and they would fight at at uh, Ekmud, which would be another famous victory for the Vu and a couple other battles. The Vu would accidentally, and this is at Battle of Ekmud, he would accidentally, as he usually does, would run into a massive army. But this time he was thinking he was chasing a screen of infantry, but it was actually an entire Russian force. The Vu would then stubbornly hold 
the Austrians as they pressed hard on his army, almost breaking his uh, flank. But well-placed artillery turned the attack, and once again, he beat back a much larger force at the battle. And then, yeah, and he would actually get uh, another title, like Prince of Ekmuk, which is pretty uh, interesting. It was just another famous, spectacular holding action where he surely would have lost, but he, he just turned it around. And at the Battle of Aspring Espring, where the, uh, his army was kept out of fighting due to the, constru- the destruction of the bridges, but Napoleon's army was still across and it was trapped, and the Vu would then get on a rowboat and row across to be personally with the emperor, even though his army couldn't be committed. And six weeks later, he would be at the Battle of uh, Ragram, he would uh, turn the left flank of the Austrians. The fighting was fierce, and the Vu would get shot out from under him and get knocked out. After the war, the Vu would be hit with a multiple with multiple tragedies. His son, named after the emperor, he was an infant, would die, unfortunately. And then his mother, who he saved from the guillotine, also passed. The Vu would have another son during this period of tragedies, which would lighten the weight of his sadness. But this really hit him hard. And uh, during this time, the Vu would struggle to keep up with his social obligations as well as his upkeep on his estates and his house in Paris. He was that was mandatory for a marshal. Also around this time, this was before the invasion of Russia, he would start making enemies with the marshals, he would be fighting more. And the other marshals really would view him kinda as harsh in peace, harsh in war, and that he really couldn't be a good commander. So now, the 1812 campaign begins, and Napoleon's uh, invasion of Russia, which would end in a tragedy, where the Vu would, throughout this campaign, not only have to fight with the Russians, but he also have to fight his fellow marshals. The Vu's uh, distant and tactless nature isolated him from the rest of the marshals and from Napoleon himself. And the Russian campaign was a grand coalition formed by Napoleon, uh, where a bunch of defeated, uh, once enemies turned allies like Austria and Prussia, and a couple small German and Italian states would make up half his army. And Napoleon would attempt to bring in Turkey, who was currently at war with Russia, but the Turkish army was at the brink of collapse and decided to make a quick peace of Russia to save themselves. Sweden also would not be joining the invasion after their defeat the previous year at the loss of Ferdinand. And um, before the invasion, the Vu would get into a final showdown with the Minister of War, Berthier, in front of Napoleon. And this was a showdown, just a typical fight about equipment. And the Vu then, uh, once the Vu left to command his army, all the marshals would grab Napoleon's ear and start talking shit about the Vu, and they would start bickering at one another, and they would really turn the Vu against Napoleon. And the seeds were planted of distrust, and we'll see throughout the Russian campaign, Napoleon would get fed up with the Vu. And on June 23rd, the invasion was launched. The Vu was particularly interested in the invasion because it was uh, viewed kind of as a war to expand the Polish kingdom, which he wanted the crown of. And the Vu, during the beginning of this invasion, would fight with Napoleon's brother, Jerome, now, who had little military experience. And the Vu viewed Jerome as spoiled and entitled, and Jerome's army was barely equipped and moved at a snail's pace. And the Vu was kind of the exact opposite of him, of Jerome, and in almost all aspects, and their clash was inevitable. The, Napoleon noticed Jerome's poor performance and put the Vu in charge of Jerome in... In kind of this weird way, because Jerome was a king, and uh, the Vu was a marshal, so one couldn't command the other. But Napoleon decided that, in specific specific circumstances, that that uh, the Vu would be in charge of Jerome in battles, basically only in battles. And once Jerome found out about this, he had a big freak out, and he just quit the campaign, and. <laughs> Uh, the Vu just did not care for him and just like couldn't stand him the whole time they're bickering. And then once he left, Napoleon was furious with the Vu for 
being so nasty yeah uh, it's just it's just like and, and th- repeatedly throughout this campaign the vu would do stuff like this he would fight and we'll see later i got some uh dialogue written down of what they said to each other all right let's keep going so the grand the grand armee would converge on slamensk and napoleon would demand the city be taken on noon the 17th the Vu would lead the attack on the city, and he faced heavy resistance, but was able to beat them back through the suburbs and brought 12-pounder cannons up to the wall, but the cannons couldn't penetrate. The vault was more successful than Ney during this battle and the other marshals was because the Russians couldn't really bear cannons on the Vu's men, so they were just able to just fight their way through the suburbs. And now... After the battle, the Russians held basically token resistance and then retreated during the night uh, because their plan was to draw Napoleon deeper into Russia and not get battle. The Vu would get into another screaming match, but this time with Marshal Marat, or King of Naples. He was a marshal and a king. And the Vu accused Marat of attacking recklessly against withdrawing Russian forces, costing lives and manpower. Napoleon interested by the Vu's uh, accusation let this fight happen in front of him and this only got worse when Mar- Marat um, after the fighting they would uh, Napoleon would be would uh, demand both of them to make peace and work together and nothing really was done of it but then things got really worse when Marat tried to attack a Russian position but the Vu denied it saying that it was um, that wasn't worth it and then Marat would a plot would go over the Vu's head to Napoleon, where Napoleon would take some men away from the Vu and put them under Marat. And but this didn't help at all, and there was a big screaming match. And uh, the marshals were actually on the cusp of literally killing each other in a duel. <laughs> so they're in the middle of the Russian campaign, and they're screaming at each other, and they're about to kill each other. But then they have to fight the Russians, and it's it's just getting bad. Another thing I want to know is that the Rush, that the French army during the invasion was in a terrible, terrible state, and they were dying of disease, and all kinds of stuff. But the Vu's army was the exception to the rule, and he stayed. His army stayed in great shape during the invasion up till, you know, the retreat from Moscow. Uh, so anyway, let's get on to the Battle of Borodino. Where Napoleon was approaching Moscow, and General Gontuzdov knew he needed to fight at least a token battle before Moscow. The Russians took defensive positions at Borodino before the battle, and Napoleon went over a plan of attack with his marshals. The Vu would creatively suggest that he march around the left flank of the Russian army during the night, and then in the morning attack them in the rear. This plan was overly ambitious for Napoleon, and he denied the Vu's plan. And he ordered that the Vu would push the center and attack the redoubts. The next day, the Vu would actually take personal command of his corps during the battle when his corps commander got wounded. And the Vu would get, actually get knocked out from, he would yet again get knocked out from under him while his horse was shot out. And then he would also get grazed by a cannonball and then shot in the thigh. <laughs> But he refused to go off the field, and people were begging him. He could barely walk, but he refused, drawing his sword and screaming. And uh, they t- eventually took their head out, and uh, near the end of the battle, Napoleon refuses to commit the old guard to defi- decisively end the battle, and the Russians walk away, bloodied but intact. Napoleon then successfully marched into Moscow and awaited for Tsar Alexander to come and make peace with him. Alexander never came forward with the olive branch, and eventually as winter slowly started to approach, the writing was on the wall, and especially when the Russian people burnt down their own city Mos- <laughs> their own city of Moscow. So it was time for a retreat, it was time to go, and the Vu left the city pretty late, in, and pretty close to winter, October 19th, and um, they embarked on a tre- the treacherous, whatever, I slurred that, journey back to Central Europe. The Grand Armée was harassed and uh, was just harassed the whole time. 
and uh, Napoleon did something. He was a little depressed about the retreat, and he just he was burning out. And during this time, he decided that he was going to have a, a meeting with his marshals around the small Russian village to discuss how to get out of Russia. The Vu suggested to retire uh, to Somensk, by the way, of Medin, which was, according to the historians, a good idea. And, and because they would have more forage and uh, stuff like that. But this plan was really sound. But Marat, his enemy, called him a coward. So the Vu Marat, and then they start fighting again, have another screaming match in the middle of this meeting where Napoleon disbands the meeting and he decides that he would go the way of Slemensk, but not the Vu's way by Lunga and Imal. I, I can't read Russian. So he, he, Napoleon chose a different path, which would, you know, be treacherous and lead to his downfall. The Vu would then be ordered to take the rear guard. But the Vu, he was a great general, don't get me wrong. But he wasn't best at rear guard. He was a little slow, and he was more tactful than more fluid in retreating. The Vu would then, you know, after a little while and after him being too slow, he'd be replaced by Ney, uh, who was more aggressive. Ney would slowly retreat with the Vu, but while the fighting got heavy uh, with the constant attacks by the Cossacks, and Ney was moving pretty slowly too, they, um, Ney would then get cut off from the Vu. And the Vu would send multiple dispatches saying, come on, let's, let's pick up the pace. You know, we're, we're about to get cut off. But Ney refused, and the Vu then just left, leaving to save his army. Now, this was the end for the Vu. Uh, Napoleon was furious. The army loved Ney. And the fact that the Vu abandoned him to die in the Russian winter, you know, the Vu was done. And um, Ney, uh, later named the bravest of the brave, would remarkably break out and retreat the French lines. But the Vu would then, you know, because Ney was so bloodied after his uh, breakout, would then, you know, leave the Vu to take the rear guard for the rest of their retreat. Once they made it back to relatively safe, relative safety, Napoleon would leave the army and return to Paris to raise a new, new troops for the inevitable showdown with Russia that would come in the spring. Marat would be, unfortunately, put in charge of the army once Napoleon left. And Marat was, I'm not going to lie, he was an excellent marshal and commander, but leading an army, uh, Napoleon's army particularly, the, the pressure of that, and the retreat from Russia led to his breaking point, where Marat declared Napoleon a madman and got into a, one last big throwdown with the Vu. And I got some dialogue here where the Vu barked uh, that Marat was king. Oh, uh, so the Vu barked that Marat was king by the grace of the emperor and blood of Frenchmen. Uh, Marat yelled back, saying that I'm the king of Naples, just as the Austrian emperor is the king of Austria. And I could do what I want, fuck you, and then left. And then he ran back to Naples. The Vu would then return to Germany disgraced by the emperor and sentenced to administrative, administrative work. <laughs> uh, till uh, he would basically be sentenced to a fate worse than death, death's work for the Vu. He hated that kind of stuff, but he was good at it. And he spent some time in Germany. Uh, but, and, but this was around the time when the Austrians decided that they were going to join against the Russians. And Napoleon needed every embodied man that he could get that was still loyal to him. Now, the Vu was disgraced and doing administrative work, but the Vu was loyal. And Napoleon knew that. So he would order him to raise a new army and take up defensive positions behind the Elba to defend that behind that behind the Elbe to defend Hamburg and Holstein. The Vu during this time, would request both cities to prepare for a siege that he thought was going to happen. Both cities ignored the request, and sudden and Davu, as he predicted, got cut off and retreated into Hamburg to prepare for the siege, which no one wanted. Davu efficiently then tore down the suburbs to build a defensive line, and he would wall and he would uh, put 350 cannons 
along the city's walls with 76 12-pounder cannons. The Vu would then organize creatively flying companies, which were quick-reaction horse-drawn cannons that were designed to plug Russian holes that they might break through in you know, their lines or their fortifications. These, these horse-drawn artillery would ride up at quick speed, set up canister shot, and then decimate any enemy, any Russian force that would come or Austrians. And this worked to great effect. And throughout the siege, the Vu would hold down a force three times his size. The Vu's old enemy that I cannot, for the life of me, remember his name, Bernet, Bernetta, whatever, who uh, s- traded his marshal's baton for the crown of Sweden due, due to his age. And he wanted to keep the Swedish throne, like Marat, and both of them, Marat and um, Bernard, or whatever, um, both of them defected to the Allies to keep their throne. And once the Vu's old rival reached Hamburg, he thought the siege was going to be quick and that he was going to get his Swedes to see combat and get a quick victory. But he slowly, uh, he, he, he slowly found out over a course of a couple of days that the Vu was in charge of defending the fort and, of Hamburg. And he he's like, oh, fuck, I'm done. I quit. I'm out. And he takes his army away, knowing that a siege with the Vu would be just, just a complete pain in the ass. And it, it really was. He did not make it easy. Um, the Russians would attack... Uh, they would attack in February <laughs> and were just completely decimated. Uh, they were appalled several times, so then they quit doing that. And they switched to uh, just trying to starve out the defenders. The Vu would keep uh, officers in the tallest tower of Hamburg uh, so that and be able to see all the uh, Russians around them. So anytime there was any movement whatsoever, the Vu would know about it instantly. And crazy enough, even after the Pauline's abdication, the Vu refused to surrender because every time the Russians would come up to him, or he would think it's a trap. And the Vu only surrendered after he got orders from the new government. And when his cousin personally wrote out the Hamburg to tell him you, you got to stop, which is just, it's just funny and pretty Vuish, I guess. The Vu would then return home. And for a brief period of time with his family till the Napoleon's return during the Hundred Days campaign. The Vu was then, unfortunately, <laughs> for Napoleon and the Vu, assigned to Minister of War, which the Vu did not want. But Napoleon needed a man he could trust. And the Vu hated his position, and he threatened to resign a couple times. And but he was able to raise two hundred eighty thousand men in eight weeks. But during this time, every time a marshal or a general would disagree with him, he'd be like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna resign if you don't listen to me." But the Vu really just wanted to be with Napoleon, and a lot of historians think that the Vu should have been with Napoleon, that he would have been a better general than some of the other marshals out there, and especially at Waterloo. But you know. After Waterloo, Napoleon retreats. He uh, his army breaks and he goes back to Paris. And once he's there, Davu is goes up to him, and he says that we could still save this thing, but we need the coup de government because during this time, Napoleon kind of he returned to power, but he started giving other ministers uh, more prominent positions, and his plan basically was to try to make it as hard as possible for the Bourbons to restore the throne because it was getting really too too democratic, too free. And so Napoleon didn't have as much power as he once did. But the Vu said to Napoleon, they said that we we need to get the army. We 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 need to get an army in here. We could we could fight fight them off, that we could still save this thing. But Napoleon uh really didn't want to. He was kind of burnt at this point. He was done. And Basically, the time for uh, a complete takeover of the government and raising another army had passed. And this new government that took power ordered Napoleon to leave Paris and ordered the Vu to give the orders. And the Vu would have one last meeting with Napoleon where they it was just a really cold goodbye 
after years of being together, just really cold. And after Napoleon left, the Vu was then put in charge of what was left of the French military. And he went straight away to fortifying Paris for a big, another long siege. Uh, there was limited fighting around the city, but the Vu was able to quickly organize an armistice. And during this armistice, he desperately tried to negotiate that the army be spared, even though they defected and sided with Napoleon, that they be spared from any uh, punitive punishment executions. But this didn't happen, and the army was left out the dry uh, by the new government. And the Vu then quit the military at that point. He said he was dumb. He was done. But he was... And... Um, Interestingly enough, the Vu would then get heavily involved with Marshal Ney's trial, even though Marshal Ney was one of the Vu's rivals. And the Vu desperately tried to help Ney, try to get him out of the predicament he was in. But during this trial, they found out it was basically a show, and the Vu would testify, but it didn't matter. Uh, and the Vu was sentenced to death and shot. The Vu would then spend some time in forced exile until he was reinstated as marshal uh, because due to his experience. The Vu was getting old at this point and he was punished harshly and he wasn't as punished as harshly as the other marshals who took an oath of loyalty to the Bourbons. The Vu kind of was living privately when he rejoined. So he, he was punished a little bit. He was forced into exile and then they decided to bring him back into the fold as a marshal because they respected his work. But during his time in exile, the Vu would once again read history and study. And after his exile, he got um, he was able to be uh, a marshal again, or he didn't do much with it. He just collected the paycheck and spent the rest of his life in peace with his family. The Vu, if we could describe him, really, in this sentence, is he was a man of loyalty and honor. And he would do what he wanted, no matter what. If people disagreed with him, he was a man of his principles, and he knew who he was. And I have a lot of respect for him. And I hope that this first episode will prove to you, too, that Davu was one of Napoleon's best generals. Well, anyway, let's see how long we went. Wow, we went on for about an hour. Well, thank you all so much for tuning in this is my first episode i i loved it i loved it. i know i messed up on some names and i messed some things up but i'm pretty confident about this read through it took forever it took all summer to write this thing out but i'm pretty confident and thank you all for listening and i'll see you in the next one